Check, the podcast where two brothers embark on a jer- thrilling journey through the realms of scientific inquiry, the enigmatic mysteries of the past, and the uncharted territories of spirituality. Join us as we explore the wonders of our world and beyond, all while embracing the roles of curious bystanders rather than experts. Together, we'll unravel the intricate tapestry of existence, blending the dichotomies of knowledge and wonder. Get ready to question, ponder, and delve into the dualities that shape our understanding of reality on Duality Check. I'm Drew. And I'm Dean. And, and we're back. Today we're going to tell you the secret history of the entire world. <laughs> You're going to hear it here first. Yes. Unless you've read this book already. We were keeping the secret, but we're going to share it. <laughs> yeah, no. So we, uh, yeah, we wanted to do something a little different that we haven't done yet. Um, in our first few episodes, which is, well, kind of with the eye pencil. Yeah. That was like an essay, but yeah. we are going to kind of review a whole book over the, yeah. ne- not the next few episodes. We're actually going to do right. other topics in between and we'll come back and do it in parts. Yeah. It'll be kind of a series of these and we'll do a few chapters and we'll just kind of talk about, take some snippets of it, talk about it. Right. Um, yeah. So, so this is the secret history of the world. By Mark Booth, right? Formerly Jonathan Black. Yeah. This is a book that I found out about a few yeah. years ago. I don't even remember how I found out about it. I think I was just like browsing on Audible for you were like diving deep on an internet rap, uh, rabbit hole. Maybe. Yeah. I, I think it was actually just like it was recommended as like you might be interested in oh, from really? another on book. On Audible? Yeah. That makes um, sense, too. So the first version of the book was by Jonathan Black. At the time he released the first book, he was a little bit paranoid. I've actually like seen an interview with him about mm. this, too. He was a little bit paranoid of, like, was he going to get in trouble for, like, releasing this information, essentially? Oh, he was... He was worried about the people who might be covered in these, these beliefs that might... right. So, like, the the premise of the book is that it's the history of the entire world back from creation up till now. Yeah. But from the point of view of, like, the secret societies of the world. And it's kind of an amalgamation. He takes and pulls from lots of the different, different secret texts. societies, different yeah. texts, different traditions. And, different religions. Right. And sort of assembles this overarching view yeah, that was taught, uh, you know, the initiates, like he talks a lot about the initiates of uh, this mystery schools. Right, throughout so, the years, right. Yeah, so this is kind of the point of view of the initiate seeking to, you know, learning about and seeking to have the knowledge of the mystery school or whatever. So that's kind of uh, the intro to the intro here. Um, but yeah, we want to read the introduction here because it's pretty good at doing what we tried to do just now. Yeah. Basically suspend your disbelief and uh, don't try and take this as like some literal, historical, archaeological, yeah. yeah, scientifically you know, <laughs> validated yeah, history. Right. This is like a subjective account spiritual, of esoteric, mythic almost thought exercise account of the world, right? Yeah. So it starts in the introduction. This is a history of the world that has been taught down the ages in certain secret societies. It may seem quite mad from today's point of view, but an extraordinarily high proportion of the men and women who made history have been believers. Historians of the ancient world tell us that from the beginnings of the ancient civilization to the collapse of Rome, public temples in places like Thebes, uh, Eleusis, and Ephesus 
had priestly enclosures attached to them. Classical scholars refer to these enclosures as the mystery schools. Here, meditation techniques were taught to the political and cultural elite. Following years of preparation, Plato, um, Asili, I don't know how to pronounce that one. That's a hard one. Um, Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, Cicero, and others were initiated into the secret philosophy. At different times, the techniques were used by the schools and the um, the techniques used by these schools involved sensory deprivation, breathing exercises, sacred dance, drama, hallucin hallucinogenic drugs, and different ways of redirecting sexual energies. These techniques were intended to induce altered states of consciousness, in the course of which initiates were able to see the world in new ways. Anyone who revealed the, to outsiders what had been taught inside the enclosures was executed. Um, is that Iamblichus, the Neoplatonic Platonist, Plato, Neo, Neoplatonist, yeah, is it Platonist? Yeah, Neo, Neoplatonist, Neoplatonism philosopher, recorded what happened to two boys who lived in Ephesus one night, lit up by rumors of phantoms and magical practices of more intense, more blazingly real reality hidden inside the enclosures. They let their curiosity, curiosity get the better of them. Under cover of darkness, they scaled the walls and dropped down the other side. Pandemonium followed. Audible all over the city, and in the morning, the boys', boys cor corpses were discovered in front of the uh, enclosure gates. In the ancient world, these teachings of the mystery schools were guarded as closely as nuclear secrets are guarded today. Then, in the 3rd century, the temples of the ancient world were closed down as Christianity became the ruling religion of the Roman Empire. So, yeah, that's what the book's about. It's about oh. those teachings, those, like, secret teachings. The the stuff that went underground when Christianity... Right. And all, a lot... Well, a lot of the monotheistic religions... Yeah, so power. it was... It was almost the reaction to the the way that the world was moving in that direction, right? Mm -hmm. So they were they were forced to hide and to go underground and become mysterious. Right. And but even when those things were like practiced in that society, it was still secret and it was still like you will not. That's what talk they were describing, it, right? right? Yeah, the two boys. Or so yeah, you might get found. <laughs> in the gutter. You might think you find in the gutter at the front of the gate. Interesting. Um, this other passage was, was interesting because it kind of gives you an idea of like people still think about these stories and these ideas today and they use them in their creative creative endeavors. So it says, in mystery schools, candidates wishing to join were made to fall down a well, undergo trial by water, squeeze through a very small door and hold logic chomping uh, ch logic chopping discussions with anthropomorphic animals. Ring a bell? Lewis Carroll is one of the many children's writers. Other than others are the Brothers Grimm, uh, Antoine de saint Exupéry, uh, C.S. Lewis, and the creators of The Wizard of Oz, and Mary Poppins, who have been influenced by the secret philosophy with a mixture of the topsy-turvy and childlike literalness these writers have sought to undermine the common sense materialistic view of life. They want to teach children to think backwards, look at everything upside down and other way around and break free of established fixed way of thinking. Mm. Dude. So yeah. that's like, you know, like you see these like cult classics, you know? Right. Yeah. That, like this is the type of thing that's like the line, the witch in the wardrobe, yeah. C.S. Lewis, like you, yeah, yeah. you walk through and you're in like, or like Peter Pan and Neverland, right? Like, yeah. Or obviously like uh, Alice and Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, Alice in Wonderland, like going down the rabbit hole. But even like Wizard of Oz, Mary Poppins was were there. These were like allegories or like um, um, it's like fictionalized uh, representations of like that sort of esoteric, like absurdist yeah. subjective experience right. that you have while you're in those altered states of consciousness. Yep. And they go on, they talk about it later, and I think we'll probably talk about it too, but like the, the 
cave of dark, like the the cave. Uh, we'll we'll the talk about allegory of the cave. With yeah, Plato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the allegory of the cave, and it's like actually like the human skull. You know, where the mind is mm. is the uh, one trapped inside the. Yeah, yeah. The cave of the mind of the skull. What I what's what I find interesting about this because I've like actually been. This is part of why like this book appealed to me, and maybe how I found it because I was doing a lot of reading on like. Uh, uh, psychotropic drugs like you know magic mushrooms and DMT. I had just finished uh, Rick Strassman's book, I believe, on DMT and uh, okay. molecule. And I'm yeah, like, that'll lead you starting to, to like get obsessed with these like altered states of consciousness. And I somehow come across this book, which like it's a really cool for someone like me who hasn't like read super deeply in all of these traditions, like oh, as like an introduction, like a s simplification, like a dip your toe in sure. the water of these like esoteric knowledge. Um, but it all seems to be like those, those techniques like drowning and squeezing uh, through a hole, squeezing like, through a hole, like all of these like extreme conditions you can get your body in. Right that can cause an altered state of consciousness is essentially the same thing that's happening inside your brain with, uh, hallucinogens, mm -hmm. except, uh, I believe the secret societies don't like, they're sort of like proud of the idea that like, it's important to them that they do it without some, without the absolute necessity of it probably of, yeah. Like using an outside tool, like a drug. Right. But it seems like they obviously still do it. Like they probably, especially as for the initiates, like with right. the, what they described for the initiates themselves. Right. Um, it didn't like they didn't say hallucinogenic drugs for the initiates. It was more of that's like part of their normal practices. Once you're once you're a member mm. of what would be the mystery schools, right? Right. That's when maybe the hallucinogenic like. But to get your mind to the place, you have to go through the trials. You know. Yeah, like maybe it was part of the practice to like give you the hallucinogenic experience first to get your mind adapted and then try to teach you how to achieve that state without it. Or the opposite, because like what they're saying here says candidates wishing to join were made to fall down a well, undergo trial by water, squeeze through a very small door and hold logic chopping discussions with anth anthropomorphic animals. So it, was, it the hallucinogens weren't even mentioned in the initiates, right? So the initiates, you know, they're they're trying to join this thing, and you don't even get the hallucinogenic drugs until you're already joined it. It seems, right? So maybe t in order to get your mind to a place where the hallucinogenic drugs can actually help you, you have to do these trials. You have to you have to fall down a well. You have to you have to you know survive the water, squeeze through a, a small door, and and have a Logic, like once your brain is like tired enough, you're going to start hallucinating hallucinating right. naturally. I mean, there's other techniques too, like uh, that are like widely used, like uh, sleep deprivation, yeah, yeah, fasting. Yeah, they talked to, yeah, they do, they talked about that too. And they did um, sensory, oh, yeah, they said that breathing exercises. They even say sacred dance, drama, right? Dance is a big one that's used in a lot of tribal societies, like, yeah. uh, like a drum circle, yeah. There was, and like there was dancing the, to exhaustion as a way to like bring on a visionary state. Who was it that talked about like having to, had an experience with like monks in like the mountains of Tibet or something? Oh, it was a story I heard or it was on somebody's podcast where, or it was just an ancient telling of somebody who'd visited the monks in Tibet. Mm. And they talked about like the person being um, like, they like saw them as like the next Buddha or something. And then they they did a drum circle for them and they showed how they could levitate a rock using sound. Mm. And they did like a drum circle to like beat, beat to the drums and at a certain distance from this wall and the wall reverberating the sound. Anyway. Interesting. Yeah. We'll have to look into that more to find out the whole story yeah. of that. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Let me. What's that down. next section you Andrew had in down. mind? Uh the other thing this makes me think of is um, there's a book I read a l years ago by this dude, Hank Wesselman. He used to actually teach here at American River in town. Mm. Um, I think he taught like a shamanism and witchcraft and mythology sort of course. Um, he took the class? 
No, I never took the class, but oh. I got to meet him. Oh, okay. Um, one of my best friends' mom like was like a lifetime student of his, and would like always go to everything and buy all his books. Oh, really? She got us to like go to some of his workshops where he like would teach you how to just with drumming and like meditation and breathing techniques like induce like altered state. And I, I got close at times, but I never like went as far. But I can see how you can get there with just those things. Yeah, I want to I revisit mean, that book. I mean, if you really it's called Journey into the Spirit, Journey into the Sacred Garden by Hank Wesselman. If it, any of mm. you guys are interested, I'll link to it. Yeah, maybe we'll do one of these for that. We got to yeah, find more copyright book. free stuff, though. <laughs> <laughs> um. So to end out the introduction part of this book. Um, I'm going to read this part, just a couple paragraphs. This history of the world is structured in the following way. The first four chapters will look at what happened in the beginning as taught by the secret societies, including what is meant in the secret teachings by the expulsion from Eden and the fall. These chapters will aim to provide an account of the worldview of the secret societies a pair of conceptual spectacles so readers may the better appreciate what follows. In the following seven chapters, many figures from myth and legend are treated as historical figures. This is, what, this is the history of what happened before written records began as it was taught in the mystery schools and is still taught in some secret societies today. Chapter 8 includes the transition into what is conventionally thought of as the historical period uh, but the narrative continues to tell stories of monsters and fabulous beasts, of miracles and prophecies and historical figures who conspired with disembodied beings to direct the course of events. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's giving you an over because we're going to do the first seven chapters, and this is kind of like beginning before history even right. begins. Right. This is the stories. This is the myth that this they is the lived with. Yeah. You know. Like they were the first kind of humans in a sense. And that's actually what it what it ends on is talking about the the first incarnate of human spirit. Mm. When they talk about how chimps. Yeah, he, he sort of I find it inter well we'll, we'll wait till we get there, but I find it interesting the way he treats like the creation myth. Like he talks yeah. about humans. And if you break down what he's saying, he's clearly talking about humans before they're actually humans. Like before a, like they're a, a physical lower, body. Or they're like even like a lower evolved life form and haven't evolved up yeah. to human. That's kind of yeah. a way he the way the way he describes it, it seems as that is like the physical aspect of humanity was lower evolved. And the they hadn't perfected the human anatomy by this point. And what was the human spirit in a sense was still there but it was in different um material form like it wasn't a physical body yet it wasn't a physical anything yet it was more of like an ethereal like yeah. idea yeah it was like particles confined to an area but not yet solidified so they, they talked about how it was almost like jelly like or like the plant phases like there was like a proto-human that was like a plant-based human form, but it wasn't a. It wasn't an animal. It wasn't what we are today. It was still the spirit that we contain. That we, can, we are contained in. If you believe in like um, um, reincarnation too, right? Like if you think about reincarnation and that the infinity of that that might bring about the consciousness. And also pan, um, panpsychism. We you know we could talk about that a little bit too, and the idea that consciousness is a is a um, inherent aspect of the material world. Like the material world was actually born out of the thought. Right. So in, in this history, this is like topsy turvy from the scientific take. So instead of matter creating consciousness, the point of view here is that consciousness created, created matter, created the, yeah, it had the, it was the thought that put matter into motion into a way that you know created. which is interesting because like we still don't i mean obviously no one knows and, sure of course <laughs> but like even the the cutting most cutting edge of our physics like no one knows what could possibly 
even cause a big bang to happen. Like, but you know what else we don't know? Our brains. We don't know anything about mm. what, what is the makeup of consciousness or the makeup of our brains and what can you consider to be consciousness mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. is the spirit and what is all these things that have been talked about for thousands of years in our history. They can't, science, modern science can't explain any of those things. So how can we take their, you know, like, like you can't just assume that what other people talk about and what might sound woo or what might sound this or that. You can't take any of that without understanding that that you can't prove them wrong, and you can't prove the like. There's no, there's no I, like obvious answer to these questions. So I mean, anybody could be right, and it could be a combination of everybody's idea of it, you know. Yeah. But this yeah. is a an account that kind of like summarized like a lot of like, in, and it's kind of intuitive in a sense of like the way that they put it together mm -hmm. and like how you think of like your own anatomy and your mind and like how those things are completely different things, but they are brought together to form this entity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was that that, uh, where was that one part toward the end of the, well, I was going to, go into panpsychism a little bit to give people an okay. idea of like, where, this is kind of like the a basis of like the idea of like um, where these stories come from is like the idea that the, our consciousness and our human spirit was, was still here before we were had a physical animal form that we do today. So basically in panpsychism, um, they think of conscious consciousness as a fundamental aspect of reality um, panpsychism suggests that consciousness is not exclusive to living beings with complex brains, but it is a fundamental feature of the universe itself. It proposes that consciousness is a fundamental property, much like space, time, and matter. Within panpsychism, there is a concept called pan experiential. <laughs> pan, I knew I was going to mess up. Pan experientialism. Mm. It's close enough. This idea suggests that not only do all things possess some form of consciousness, but also they also have some level of subject subjective experience. This does not necessarily mean that everything is self-aware the way we are, um, but rather that there is a basic form of that experience, experience associated yeah, right. with it. Right. Like there is something it's like to be a bacteria crawling. Yeah. Yeah. There is an experience there, whether the thing is experiencing it the way that you might expect them to experience right. it, they, they, means they don't, nothing, you know? That bacterium probably doesn't have a concept of I, like it probably has a concept of like, go towards what I want, get away from what I don't want, you know? Yeah, and it doesn't have to be a thought in the sense that we think about it, right? But that's still an experience. It's absolutely an experience, whether it's guided by instinct or or thought, it's, it's an experience. Where I get... Um, Well, where it gets, where, I think less people have a problem with that. More people have a, like, start to differ with panpsychism when you get into, like, consciousness and, in, 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 quote, unquote, inanimate matter, like a rock or whatever, right? Right. But I think it goes back even before that. Like, we're talking, like, the creation event, right? Like, whatever was the prime mover, the unmoved mover that got things going. Yep. Like that is the consciousness that puts things into being that eventually coagulate and form into later on living creatures, right? Yeah. Biological living creatures anyway. Right. Yeah. So they do talk about this It's the combination problem within panpsychism. It says one challenge that panpsychism faces is the combination problem. If consciousness is a fundamental property of basic elements, how does it give rise to the unified and complex forms of consciousness found in higher organisms? Critics argue that panpsychism has difficulty explaining how individual conscious entities combine to form more complex conscious experiences. Right. So, like, how is our, con our um, consciousness... Um, formed in comparison to an ant if they if all of the basic elements that make up the universe all have a similar state of consciousness right well i imagine so i've heard um people like uh donald hoffman yeah interviewed uh, him, like the yeah thing and, yeah and he falls into the panpsychist camp and for him like the way he explains it is 
basically whichever side you fall on, like on the materialist or on the like panpsychist consciousness first side of things, then you still, either way, you have a miracle at the beginning. Like you have something that's yeah. unexplained. You still have to allow for that. And so either you start with matter and you have to, you have this big giant mystery of how you come up with subjective experience from inanimate matter, or you have the problem of starting with consciousness and building the consciousness side, which is easier to do if you start with consciousness, but then you have the problem of bridging from that to matter. So either way, it's kind of a conundrum. Yeah. But it's an interesting one. And Donald Hoffman's book on panpsychism, mm -hmm. like that sort of worldview and interpretation of modern science is really interesting. Yeah. I just started listening to, um, to his book on audible. Yeah. The case against reality. Yeah. We'll link to it. Um, but I also watched him on Lex Friedman, their podcast he did mm -hmm. with Lex Friedman. Yeah. He had a good one with Lex. Yeah. Yeah, that was really good. Lex is a perfect interviewer for him, for for a lot of people. Yeah, they went out there. It was like which three was hours was, or something. It was pretty trippy. Yeah. It actually kind of did the same thing to me that reading this book does to me, yeah. where it's like, I don't know, I've had this experience reading this book, The Secret History, where like I have to pause every so often because I'm listening, right? So I have to like pause every so often because I realize I haven't been listening for the last couple paragraphs because like it keeps inspiring like these weird trains of thought. Yeah. It's like uh Yeah, it's like the you know, the accelerant on a on a imaginative fire. Like it's right. You know right. what I mean? Like it definitely it, It's it a just, fun experience to read for if even if you don't believe any of it, just for absolutely. that sort of like dreamlike aspect of yes. it. Yes. I mean it does a lot of the same things that reading those those cold classic childhood, you know, mm. fanciful books and you know right like it's the same kind of idea like it's just a it's a narrative that was come about by a lot of different other stories and right and it just sparks the imagination because it has a lot of the same tropes it uses because it's all like the you know the hero and talks about a lot of like the heroes from mythology and like mm -hmm. and like what they kind of represented in this in this what's that next section you wanted to do let's okay um, what was the end of the introduction that we talked about the other night where it like essentially challenges you to like not take it seriously or do if you dare? <laughs> yeah. So I think this is the beginning of it right here. Uh, it says induce in yourself a different state of mind and the most famous and familiar histories mean something very different. In fact, if anything in the history is true, then everything your teachers taught you is thrown into question. I suspect this prospect doesn't alarm you. As one of the devotees of the ancient secret philosophies so memorably put it, you must be mad or you wouldn't have come here. Mm. That was kind of the end of that. I don't yeah. know. I might, have yeah. To, I might have skipped a bit. That's like, no, that's like the attitude though, like to go into yeah. this book with. Like, yeah. Just go at it with your imagination. If anything in there is true, you kind of have to deal with it, which is interesting. I do want to read this because I, I, I skipped right over even though it was mm, right ahead. above it. It says to help with all the with <laughs> to help with all, the all important work of the imagination, there are strange and uncanny illustrations integrated throughout, some of which have not previously been seen outside the secret societies. There are some also illustrations of some of the most familiar images from world history, the greatest icons of our culture. Sphinx, Noah's Ark, and Trojan Horse, Mona Lisa, Hamlet, and the Skull. Because all of these are shown to have strange and unexpected meanings according to the secret societies. Mm. So that was just before that. But yeah, that kind of gets us right into the beginning here. Cool. Chapter one. Well, it's a pretty loose structure here, so we're going to... Yeah. We'll take a... Take a we'll little take break. Our first here. music break here, and uh, we'll get into the meat of things. Yeah.
Welcome back. Hello. All right. We are back. Do you want to... We got to do our beer introduction. Yeah, we got to keep that tradition going. Might at well. least for a while. Yeah, might as well. Until we just forget and then nobody cared and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try stopping e- eating sugar and drinking, like do a full cleanse here. Come oh, out. Well, so yeah, I support that. I yeah. probably won't be drinking during that time, but for now... We are drinking Mouthful of Miracles Cold IPA by Dust Bowl Brewing Company. 6.6%. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> Which is in Turlock, California. It's cool. It's got like a kind of a Christmassy, like Snuff, white snowflakes. And and I really like this one. Hops. Yeah, it's actually good. It's the it's, kind of it's hoppy like celebration. I like. It's like the celebration style. Yeah, it's like biting hops. Like they're really. Yep. They got a very upfront, in your face flavor, which hit I that dig. top palate. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're back. We were going to get into chapter one here. I'm just going to read the uh, first few paragraphs here and get us, get us talking about it. Okay. What's the. So in the beginning is the name of the chapter. Right. God peers at his reflection. The look, the gl- looking glass universe. Mm. That's the... That's the subtitle of the yep. chapter. Yeah. Cool. Once upon a time, there was no time at all. Time is nothing but a measure of the changing positions of objects in space. And as any scientist, mystic, or madman knows, in the beginning... There were no objects in space. For example, a year is a measure of the movement of the earth around the sun. A day is a revolution of the earth on its axis. Axis. Since by its own account, neither earth nor sun existed in the beginning, the authors of the Bible never meant to say that everything was created in seven days in the usual sense of a day. Despite this initial as absence of matter, space, and time, something must have happened to get everything started. In other words, something must have happened before there was anything. Such a paradox. And there's a really cool image that kind of like illustrates like the, I don't know, the essence of like what was happening in the beginning. It's uh, called... The Chaos by Bernard Picard, 1731. Uh, see if I can get a copy of that to put I, in there. I think I've already got Chapter it in our art. file. Cool. Sorry about that. Um, it's, so it's, it's called The Chaos. It's got a little description here. It says, It is more likely that in the beginning, intelligence evolved out of matter sometime after the creation of matter, or is it more likely that intelligence was inherent in matter from the beginning? Is our intelligence a natural outgrowth of the intellect, intell, intelligence of the universe or a freak accident? Yeah. Until recently, scientific materialists have insisted that in both cases, the former answer is quite obviously the correct one. But in fact, it is not obvious. And recently, cutting edge physicists and leading philosophers such as Francis Crick and Galen Strawson have reconsidered panpsychism as a convincing cosmology. And Donald Hoffman. And Donald Hoffman. Yeah. <laughs> and more, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Many more. Um, yeah, yeah, just that original creation moment. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's like, oh, it's too big to, like, have in your head. It's too, like, fundamental... Yeah, it definitely, once you start thinking about it, it, it just kind of disappears. Like, it almost fills up the imagination. And mm-hmm. Like, you just like, oh, like, okay. I think I kind of understand the idea of it. Yeah, but you can't how really could you? Because, you know? like, how can anything come You need to nothing? picture it, right? Our brains work, you know, differently, but. Um, but it makes sense. There's, like, clearly there can't be time if there's nothing for time to tell the difference between Mm -hmm. yeah like they talk about like in here like i'll even read it just since it's right here since there was no thing when something first happened it is safe to say that the first happening must have been quite different from the sorts of events we regularly account 
in terms of laws of physics. Right. You know, like it was just such an extreme event, whatever mm-hmm. happened to initiate it, it's at least from our perspective, right? Right. Wow. To think about that is like, do you think about like that? There's still something that was a th- was a thing before things were other things. Well, no. <clears throat> I mean, that's where like you just run into because God, because like, right? You can't. Yeah, you can't. Um, you can't conceptualize nothing. Yeah, especially when you're talking about everything that we know being come from that. Well, the entire way our brain works is like to compare things together in order to differentiate one mm-hmm. thing from another. Yeah, how do you differentiate one nothing from another nothing? Right. Is that get you into the infin- infin- infinity of it and like the tiny, like the mini, um, um, just like the, what, uh, what was that topic or that guy? Uh, it was uh, Einstein's intuition, that whole idea. We've talked about it before. Even on here, I think. Yeah. The the idea that everything is like... Well, that was more about like how space and time is structured. Yeah, but to think about it like... Uh, does he talk about like the Big Bang? I guess he does, huh? Yeah. At some point. I forget his take on it. I can't remember exactly either. It's been a, been a little while since I looked at it. But... I okay. mean... I guess if you just like even without his specific, if you understand the idea of what he's talking about, and like, like if it there was if it's just going, I guess you'd have to understand like his framework for it. But yeah, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, where else were we going? Ah, uh, here we go. While you are still on the threshold and before you risk wasting any more time on this history, I must make it plain that I am going to try to persuade you to consider something that may be all right by a mystic or a madman, but which a scientist will not like. A scientist will not like it at all. To today's most advanced thinkers, academics like Richard Dawkins and Charles Simony, professor at the, of the public understanding of science at Oxford, and the other militant materialists who re- regulate and maintain the scientific wor- worldview, the mind of God is no better than the idea of a white-haired old man up above the clouds. Yeah. That's true. I mean, that's basically what it's compared to. I mean, there's nothing to argue there. Yeah. But uh, he's challenging you to uh, take it seriously if you dare. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which I find fun. Oh, here we go. So in this story, what did happen before time? What was the primal mental event, right? The, the uh, I guess they're talking about like the, the original thought that created things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in this story, God reflected on himself. So that was kind of the, the thought. I want to see myself or experience myself. Yeah. He looked, as it were, into an imaginary mirror and saw the future. He imagined beings very like himself. He imagined free, creative beings capable of loving so intelligently and thinking so lovingly that they could transform themselves and others of their kind in their innermost being. They could expand their minds to embrace the totality of the cosmos, and in the depths of their hearts they could discern, discern too. The secrets of this of its subtlest workings. Putting yourself into God's position involves imagining that you are staring at your reflection in a mirror. You are willing the image of yourself you see there to come alive and take on its own independent life. So that was kind of the original thought then. Yeah. It was like, I want to see myself. I want to. I've, what's funny is like, Obviously, I've heard these ideas because I've read the book before, but, like, the ideas themselves seem, like, familiar. I don't know if it's from, like, New Agey stuff that I got into for a while. But, like... As far as the teachings go or, like, the philosophy uh, is or what? Like, I've encountered the idea that God was essentially trying to create some people for himself to hang out with later on down the road. Yeah, like, he he got bored. Yeah, he just... 
I'm going to create some company for myself. Well, and it's like the idea too of like, I think they, t- they go into it here, but like the stories of like uh, Zeus and like a lot of these other gods of the early ages, like the, like the polytheistic gods, mm-hmm. like they were able to like cut themselves open and put a body inside them or whatever. It might be a beating heart from somebody who recently died. And like, they would spawn the fully grown versions. Like, it's like a weird um, yeah. time. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, let me talk about some of the... I know it goes into... I mean, it's hard because I want to read a lot of this, but I also don't want to get copyrighted. <laughs> and we'll take the show down, or this episode down later on. Down if we have road, to. Once we're popular enough for us to get copyrighted on this. <laughs> So it goes on to say, uh, today's scientists will tell you that in the hour of your greatest anguish, there is no point in crying out to the heavens with any expression of your deepest, most heartfelt feelings, because you will find no answering resonance there. The stars can show you only indifference. The human task is to grow up, to mature, to learn to come to terms with with this indifference. The universe that this book describes is different because it was made with humankind in mind. In this history of the universe, the, an- the anthropocentric is anthropocentric. Um, every single particle of it straining directed towards humankind. This universe was nurtured, uh, has nurtured us through the millennia, cradled us, helped us, helped the unique thing that is human consciousness to evolve, and guided each of us as individuals towards the great moments in our lives. When you cry out, the universe turns towards you in sympathy. When you approach one of life's greatest crossroads, the whole universe holds its breath to see which way you will choose. Mm. You know, there's this like uh, internet meme going around where people will make fun of people who like main character syndrome. Uh, where They like feel like the whole world revolves around them. And there's like a negative aspect to that. But like this is essentially saying like, there's kind of a positive aspect to that as well, like an empowering aspect to that. Sure. Where like I can see it. The universe created you to be here, and it doesn't right. know what your next decision is going to be either. Right. So it's waiting in anticipation for you to make that choice, so it can it can change its structure, dude. In a sense, you like you got to really think about it. Like you are affecting. You're a physical thing in a physical place. It's affecting things that for all we know it's just happening for the first time and it's like an all like there's no you know we don't know but there there's no person or there's no um fate you know like you're you're not fated to a certain thing like you have some kind of free will right if you believe that um then versus like uh the determinism of materialism yeah yeah it's interesting though, because like some of these ancient religions have like a determinism too. There's like God's plan, or in like Greek mythology, you have like the three fates. Yeah, but who, you also like, got to remember out the destiny of the universe. Yeah, but that's also cross. the universe itself, right? So like yeah. you got to think about the day to day lives of the creatures on the planet yeah. and how they need to see things in order to accomplish what is needed to be accomplished for this kind of relates back to that, the economics episode last week, because like, it's, it's all about human action, right? Like it's like that whole study, that particular discipline is studied in that way a priori because it comes from human experience and we can draw information from human experience because we are human experiencers versus like studying the physical world. It's something out there that we can only do experiments with and gather data on and make up theories and refine our view. But when we're introspecting, we, in a way it's more confusing and subjective and all over the place. But at, in another way, it's more definite because you're, the answers are there within you mm. somehow. Yeah. I mean, it seems like, the micro and macro have more, have a lot in common. Like you can study within yourselves and find out a lot about the, like the geometries too. Like you think about like the geometries within life that we've been able to study and like 
now seem now with like cooler and like better and better telescopes that we're sending out into the universe. Like you're seeing a lot of these similar geometries mm, right in the, in the universe. Like you're seeing like these spirals that are also natural and like formations on earth, a physical matter. Mm. It's like, everything's built on like a, a resonant frequency. That's like, and they talk about in here how like the stars above, like actually change, like, there's some examples that I think we'll get into here. If the universe is created purposefully to create intelligent life, the uh, anthropomorphic principle, like the idea of like the Goldilocks zone, like all, like mm -hmm. you know about like all these like scientific constants that are like just right for us to be here. Like right. we're in the habitable zone around our sun, our universe, our, our atmosphere has just the right. I was just watching a video on this on like runaway global warming, like what happened to Venus mm. and like how that will eventually happen to us once the sun heats up about 10%. Uh, I see. Um, but so it's, it's just we, all we just happen to have like the perfect atmospheric composition to not like be an ice ball and not be so a volcano planet, not be a volcano. Gas. Yeah, right. Not be a nasty overheated sauna yeah i mean but i mean that we know there's cycles like there's cycles of the universe like there's cycles within our body and then there's cycles of the seasons and then there's cycles you know of the solar system like like these are all like cyclical so like it almost seems like what if there's a goldilocks zone that is like a like a, if you were to think of like a spotlight shone shone shown, shown down on like a, 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 well, for us, think of a 2D plane and you're shining a light and anything in that light is a Goldilocks zone, you know, and like you put it over a, like a different, like two dimensional creatures and they like grow and they throw a flourish. And then as the light passes, it, the ages change and like the parts of the universe change as far as what's fertile. Mm. So when that light shines on something with the, with the, uh, a certain that already has a certain chemical makeup. Maybe it's like some kind of, you know what I'm saying? Like, are you like in your analogy that light is like, is the Goldilocks zone shined through the gal? Like it's like, a, mm. I guess you would think of more like without there being an effect. So more of like a laser where it's like, I don't know. Right. I guess it wouldn't matter, but, but there's also like the strength of like electromagnetism and gravity. So like, they're just such, they're well, right to the degree where not everything clumps up, but not everything pushes apart. And like just all these different like scientific constants that make it like so freakishly, like if you multiply all those out, like it's so freakishly unlikely that we find ourselves where we do. With all these things lining up and working. Right. The way and they are. Like if you ask a materialist, well, like, oh, you're, that's the probability. That's like the anthropomorphic uh fallacy or whatever where like of course all that stuff is true because you're here but about well, infinite probability though like if, you know like you wouldn't be here to question it if it weren't true right like so we have to find ourselves in a place suitable for life because we are life but in another sense like it almost like suggests like on the spiritual side of things like it almost suggests like there's a plan like there's like a well oiled machine that is meant to be leading here. Absolutely. So uh, I'll read a little bit more in here. We'll mm -hmm. Keep going a bit. All the upside down, inside out, other way, other way around thinking of the secret societies, all that is bizarre and mind bedding and what follows stems from the belief that mind preceded matter. We have almost no evidence to go on when we decide what we believe happened at the beginning of time, but the choice we make has massive implications for our understanding of the way the world works. Mm -hmm. If you believe that matter, um, matter came before mind, you have to explain how chance come, uh, chance coming together of chemicals creates consciousness, which is difficult. If on the other hand, you believe that matter is precipitated by the cosmic mind, you have the equally difficult problem of explaining how of providing a working model from the priests. Well, wait. you have the equally difficult problem of explaining how and of providing a working model from the priests of the Egyptian temples to today's secret societies. 
the uh, Al Falagors, I don't know how to say it, to uh, Rudolf Steiner, the great Austrian initiate of the late 19th to early 20th century. This model has always been conceived of as serious of thoughts emanating from the cosmic mind, pure mind to begin with. These thoughts, thought emanations later became a sort of proto matter energy that became increasingly dense. This became matter so ethereal that it was finer than the gas with, without particles of any kind. Eventually the emanations became gas, then liquid and finally solids. Right. That talks, Which, like that sounds eerily similar to like a big bang approach where like in the early, early big bang, like, the universe was, was the universe was too hot to form molecules. Right. So it's just a, a gaseous Right. And then eventually it cools down enough that like protons and neutrons can bind together. Well eventually like originally it was just like a soup of like quarks and subatomic particles. Right. And it has to cool down enough for those to clump together into protons and neutrons. And then this it's then the it has snowball to clump effect. into protons and neutrons. And then later on you can get electrons. Mm -hmm. And it's like this process of like coming from pure energy down into matter. And that's basically modern science's take on the big bang as well. Like that's actually not that far away. Right. It's just, they attach a lot of, uh, well, stories it's coming it. from mind. It's coming from yeah. creation from like a thought. It's not happening because the matter is not, what eventually creates the thought that can look back on it. Yeah. It's the, the thought, you know, emanating, which creates some kind of, um, effect on the, whatever was, whatever was so inactive that it didn't even create matter. Right. Whatever was so. Well, that's interesting too. Cause like, if you think about like, what is a thought, right? Like what is a thought physically? It's like a, it's like a, a pattern of energy signals going off in your brain or so, like something like that. Let's say the materialist conception of it, but like we're talking a pattern of energy, like evolving over time. That is a thought, right? And that's kind can kind of be a metaphor for like the creation of sure. the universe too. Like right. So you could describe everything coming out of a singularity. Sure. And forming particles. But that was energy changing over time, and in, in that could be defined as a thought anyway. Yeah, I guess that's true. So then, like almost like the telling of it the way it is 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 a way to uh, put it to a story so that people remember over time. Sure, the telling of it in that way. Yeah, as a so way to uh, immortalize it in a sense. This could be like secret and societies, these, like these preserving from. knowledge from like the pre ice age flood. Right. And like, this is like their best way to like preserve what was at one point scientifically understood, but mm -hmm. gets passed down in myth. Yeah. Or it could just be that that's kind of the way it is. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like maybe there is, I don't know. Right. I mean, yeah, that's kind of where our whole discussion is, is just the, the dichotomies between those two things, the science and, and spirituality aspects of, it makes my mind go crazy because, like, I'm, like, a reluctant agnostic. Like, I'm not comfortable enough to, like, fully believe in God, but I'm not an atheist either. Like, I think right. there has to be something. Right. So, like. It's just what it is. And are topic, we only like, just hearing stories brain. of it? Yeah. Like, everything that we know about the beginning is well, we a story. Right. We can't know anything. No, but everything we everything we hear it, and everything it, we, we like he talk points out about. like it's a belief. Well, like it's a belief right. that you're choosing. It's true. You're choosing it one way or the other. Yep. But it has huge implications whichever way you choose that right. you think it for went. your path. Right. As an individual, you choose the path as far as your And if you think you're gonna go the materials route and justify it by saying we don't have evidence for the other one, we don't have evidence for either way. Yep. Exactly. That's so what that's what makes these choice. these topics so much fun to talk about. Like you can't prove it. you can't prove any of it. So why not have the discussion? Yeah. What, uh, what what's the next bit we get? Um. Yeah. 
Uh, um, so yeah, they talk about the, um, the big why question of life, right? So they say, so the big why questions, why life, why the universe as a matter of quite elementary philosophical distinction cannot be answered by scientists or more accurately, um, not by scientists acting in their capacity as scientists. If we ask, why are we here? We may be fought it up with questions which, like the girl's earlier question, are perfectly valid in the sense of... Oh, yeah. You're skipping over this analogy that he makes. I, oh, I, I can kind of... Yeah. I think I can kind of do the analogy off memory. Okay, He's yeah. basically saying, like, he gives this analogy that, like, this boy is in love with this girl, and he asks her to, like, go out with him. And she says no. Um... And he asks her why, right? So that's the like a why question. And there's lots of ways you can answer that question. She can say, oh, my family needs me home for dinner. Mm. She can say, oh, I have this or that on my plans. Please. Like yeah. I am going to sit at home and not go out with you, right? Like these are yeah, all yeah, valid yeah. answers to why. But that's not the kind of why that the boy is asking. Yeah. Right? What the boy really wants to know is why are you rejecting me? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Is he doesn't the want to know. He wants to know the reason behind the rejection because he's basically self conscious. Well, he, that, sense, it's right? just that's what he's interested in. He's sure. interested in her and spending time with her when she says no. Like, he wants to know why she doesn't want to spend time with him, not why she couldn't happen to get there that day, right? Oh, I see what you're So, okay, like, yeah. the fulfilling answer is, why are you choosing to not spend time with me? The superficial answer is, oh, I have to go... I got some... I forgot I got to babysit, right? Like, that's a superficial answer. Right, but the real reason might be we didn't click. Right, exactly. So, yeah. And so what you're searching for in the answer to that why question is that more fulfilling deep why. And what science attempts to do is answer on those like superficial questions, but it, it doesn't technically go for that deep why. And that leads into that paragraph. So, yeah, we'll start it there. Then if we ask why we are here, we may be fought it off with, uh, with answers which, like the girl's early answers, are perfectly valid. In the, same, in the sense of being grammatically correct, answers to the question, but which leave a twist of disappointment in the pit of, of the stomach um, because they don't answer the question in, in the way that deep down we want it answered. The fact is that we, have, we all have a deep-seated, perhaps in er, 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 eradicable, Ineradicable. Well, longing for such questions to be answered at the level of intention. The scientists who don't grasp the distinction, however brilliant they are as scientists, are philosophical morons. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we can choose to give parts of our lives purpose and meaning. If I choose to play soccer, then kicking the ball into the back of the net means a goal. But our lives as a whole, from birth to death, cannot be cannot have meaning without a mind that existed beforehand to give it meaning. Right. And so like the fulfilling answers to that question is not like the superficial answer. The grammatically correct answer is, Oh, because a bunch of gas exploded and then formed and blew up into stars and then chunks around that formed into rocky planets. And right. on that little rocky planet, a bunch of water formed and a bunch of lightning storms and tectonic shifts that led to life and evolution to all these different creatures. And now you're here. Like, sure, like, that's kind of why, but it's not why in the way you want to know why are we here. Yeah. You want to know what the ultimate, like the, what the original thought was, like why did you create me in your image or right. whatever it might be. You know? You're searching for an intention, which is exactly what he's warning that scientists won't like this at all, right? Because like, right. trying to put intention on the universe. Yep. But if you believe in some sort of creator or being or a consciousness first or panpsychism, that mm. question is actually a valid question. Yep. That should be answered in the deeper manner. Uh, goes on, today we are in, 
today we are encouraged to put aside the big questions of life and death. Why are we here? What is the meaning of life? Such questions are strictly meaningless, we are told. Just get on with it. And so we lose some of the sense of how strange it is to be alive. I mean, that's so true. Like that you is. just, like when you actually sit in your room and you think about the fact that you're sitting there in your room having thoughts. And then you think about the fact that, you know, like you start getting into like a dude, you're, like you could start there and you could really get into like the fact that this is happening. Like it's and, and filled it does with get accentuated when you've done some kind of psychedelic too. I'm, mm -hmm. I must say, cause I've done the, you know, and you, or just if you can somehow maintain that perspective of a child that to like childlike wonder at sure. everything. Yeah. And I, I, Emma can attest to that as well. Like you start seeing the world differently again when you, when you have kids or at least if you're able to put yourself there, right? Kids help mm -hmm. in that because they are like that. But it's, uh, it's what was the, it was a quote from, uh, one of our previous episodes was the, on the economics one where he's like, Oh, it was from iPencil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're suffering. We're not suffering from a lack of wonders. We're sacri We're we're suffering from a lack of wonder. Yeah. Right. Like it's, you can get caught up in the routine. You can get caught up in the day to day and going to work and coming home and making dinner and taking care of kids and paying your bills and doing this and doing that and keeping up with everyone. And you just get this routine, this yep. rhythm to life and it can make you not spend the appropriate amount of time sitting there contemplating the fact that dude we're hurling in space <laughs> on a rock <laughs> yeah that in a universe that will kill us 99 percent of the places we would go yeah we happen to everything be in this moving. place that is this like magical nursery for beings like us at least at the scale that at which we live right because yeah. we live on, and it's such a finite time time scale that it's it's easy to get lost in the mundane day to day stuff. But when you really think about it, and you think about like the the amount of people, like especially when you like contemplate stuff, like the the Carl Sagan quote when he looks at the the photo of the pale blue dot when we turn the cameras backwards. I don't remember which expedition it was, like a Voyager or something, where they just sent it out into space to take pictures. And they looked back and they saw this fine little, um, like this tiny little pale blue dot that was Earth, you know. And it looks like there's this like beam of light that like is like entrenched in it. And that's what where I was going with earlier is like this idea of like this Goldilocks beam that emanates through space, you know. And yeah. obviously, I don't know what that beam, that beam of light on that photo could just be an artifact for all I know. Yeah. But if you look up, at, if you look at it. You see those rays, those those lines of light. We're pulling it up now, but yeah, it's it's weird to think about. Like if you if if that was, I don't know what that would be other than yeah, I'll an put, artifact of the camera or something. I'll put the image. Yeah, right there on the right, right there. Yeah. Yeah, he's basically just talking about like how tiny and infinite, infinitesimal it is in the scale of the universe, but how everything in the ex entire history of humans and the entire history of the earth all happened on that tiny little dot. Yeah. Here's the quote from Sagan. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everywhere, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives, the aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of com confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer. Every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended on in a sunbeam. Is that sun? Your yeah. Thing? So that's a sunbeam. That's the sun. Yeah. That's, that solves it. That's crazy. The way it looks, though, right? 
It's just illuminated by the sunbeam. It's just a tiny little dot. Cute, yeah. Oh. I don't know how far away that is. Maybe we'll find out by the time we publish this, but that's a good quote. So I was going to end with this, I guess, to the very end of that first chapter. Today we are encouraged to put aside the big questions of life and death. Why are we here? What is the meaning of life? Such questions are strictly meaningless, we are told. Just get on with it so we lose that sense of how strange it is to be alive. Did I already read this? Yeah, you got that part. I cut you off right after that. Oh, that's right. This book has been written in the belief that something valuable is in danger of being snuffed out altogether, and that as a result, we are less alive than we used to be. I am suggesting that if we look at the basics of the human condition from a different angle, we may appreciate the science doesn't really know as much as it claims to know. That if fails to that it fails to address what is deepest and highest in human experience in the next chapter we will begin to imagine ourselves into the minds of the initiates of the ancient world and to see the the world and from their perspective we will consider ancient wisdom we have forgotten and to see that perspective even though uh, as modern science encourages us to think as most solidly reliably and true are really just a matter of interpretation Little more of the little more than a trick of the light. Nice. So true. Heck yeah. Um, let me where my bookmarks go. Cool. All right. Well, maybe we should take another. Yeah, we should take a break here. Break I think. there, and we'll come back. And yeah, we might end up only getting a few chapters in on this one. I know, right? Because uh, I, I knew it was going to happen too. Yeah, so it's just this one we might be keep just getting a long sidetracked to talk series. about it, which is good. No, that's good. That's what we want. Anyway, <laughs> we'll be back. All right. Babies are good. Kids are sleeping, although they're moving around a lot. Filled up some drinks. Didn't open it, though. Talked a little bit more about things that we should have been recording for, probably. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, we're nice. on to ch- <laughs> yeah. we're on to chapter two. It's called A Short Walk in the Ancient Woods, Imagining Ourselves into the Minds of the Ancients. So, these days, we tend to think very reductively about our thoughts. We tend to go along with the prevailing intellectual fashion, intellectual fashion that sees thoughts as nothing more than words, perhaps with a penumbra of other, of other stuff, such as feelings, images, and so on, but with only the words themselves having any real significance. The wise men and women of ancient world knew how to work with these dimensions and others. And over the millennia, they created a refined images, which would help them with the work, this work as top in the mystery schools. The very early history of the world unfolds in a series of images of this type before considering these powerful and evocative images. I now want to ask the reader to begin to take part in an imaginative exercise to try to imagine how someone in ancient times, a candidate who hoped for initiation into a mystery school, would have experienced the world. 
Of course, it is a way of experiencing the world that is completely delusional from the point of view of modern science. But as this history, history progresses, we will see more and more evidence that many of the great men and women of history have deliberately cultivated this, this ancient state of consciousness. We will see that they have believed that it gives them a view of the way the world really is, the way it works, that is some of the ways that is in some ways superior to the modern way. They have brought back into the real world insights that have changed the course of, of history, not only by inspiring works of art and literature of the greatest genius, but by prompting the history's greatest scientific discoveries. Right. Therefore, let us now try to imagine ourselves into the mind of someone about two and a half thousand years ago, walking through woodland to a sacred grove or a temple such as Newgrange in Ireland or Eleusis in Greece. To such a person, the wood and everything in it was alive. Everything was watching him. Unseen spirits whispered in the movements of the trees. A breeze brushing against the cheek was the gesture of a god. If the buffeting of, of blocks of air in the sky created lightning, this was an outbreak of cosmic will. And maybe he walked a little faster. Perhaps he sheltered in a cave. When ancient man ventured into a cave, he had a strange sense of being inside his own skull cut off in his own private mental space. If he climbed to the top of a hill, he felt his consciousness race to the horizon in every direction. Out towards the edges of cosmos, he felt at one with it. At night, he, he experienced the sky as the mind of the, of the cosmos. When he walked along a woodland pathway, he would have had a strange sense of following his destiny. Today, many of us may wonder, how did I end up in this life that seems to have little or nothing to do with me? Such a thought would have been inconceivable to someone in the ancient world, where, every, where everyone was conscious of his or her own place in the cosmos. Everything that happened to him, even the sight of a moat in a sunbeam, the sound of a flight of, of a bee, or the sight of a falling sparrow, was meant to, was meant to happen. Everything spoke to him. Everything was a punishment, a reward, a warning, of a, or a premonition, premonition. If he saw an owl, for example, this wasn't a, just a symbol of the goddess. It was Athena, part of her. A warning finger, perhaps, was protruding into the physical world, into his own consciousness. It's important to understand the particular way in which human beings have affinities with physical with the physical world according to an ancients according to the ancients. They believed in a quite literal way that nothing inside us is without a correspondence in nature. Worms, for example, are the shape of intestines and worms process matter as intestines do. The lungs that enable us to move freely uh, through space with bird-like freedom are the shape, same shape as birds. The visible world is humanity turned inside out. Lung and bird are both expressions of the same cosmic spirit, but in different modes. Which is... <laughs> yeah, that's super interesting. That's interesting to think about, like, all the different processes within a human are, like, anthropomorphized in a sense. Yeah. But, like... If you do that that exercise and you follow that experience and you try to imagine yourself as someone who doesn't know any of the stuff you learn in science classes and instead you grew up in a world that is explained to you as, you know, with all these gods and goddesses and their control over nature and that all of these things are conscious actions of a deity or a spirit that would be a very different experience of life. Yeah. Like you who have an understanding of the like narrative of the physical world instead of just experiencing it as a cold act of nature. 
Right. You you you've developed a narrative behind what the physical acts of nature um, represent, in a sense, right? I mean, honestly, like when you think about it, like kind of in a way, we still live this way because we can't keep all of the scientific knowledge. Like even the best scientists, like no one, like the eye pencil, um, no one can build a pencil. No one knows how to build a cell phone, right? Like to to a lot of people, like what is a cell phone? It's something that, you know, what's an iPhone? It's something that Steve Jobs created. Even though Steve Jobs, like he was just like a loose product designer CEO. Like he didn't do all the hard work of right. integrating all the circuits and right. designing the microchips. And, you know, like that's all like a simplification. It's a narrative that we paint over the complexity of the real world in order to derive useful meaning. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of goes into like Donald Hoffman's theory of like, um, of, um, I guess he's a panpsychist though, right? Donald Hoffman, I would think you, he would at least not be offended by that <laughs> okay. classification. Um, but like the idea that, um, um, Oh, I lost my train of thought there for a second, but he basically talks about how like the um, universe is inherent. Oh, man, I lost my train of thought. We're gonna have to come back to that. Mm. Unfortunate. But yeah, the just that experience of like seeing an owl fly by and like being confident that that's like Athena telling you something. Mm hmm. That's a crazy thought. I mean, like, it's like, how different is it from, like, someone seeing, like, the Virgin Mary in their toast? Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's your... Is it a product of the human imagination or is it a product of... But even if it is a product of the human imagination, if, like, we live in a consciousness-first world, that that's meaningful. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, and... Uh, they the, in the in the his, secret history of the world they go on to talk about, um, so they go on to say more strikingly perhaps the complex symmetric shapes of plants were believed to be caused by the patterns of the stars and planets that make up the that move across the sky above, as a heavenly body takes a path that sees the curving back on itself like a shoelace. So the same shape is traced in the curling motion of a leaf as it grows or a flower. For example, they saw Saturn, which traces a sharp pattern in the sky, forming the pine needles of, of conifers. Is it a coincidence that modern science shows that pine trees contain unusual, unusually large traces of lead, the metal believed by the ancients to be inwardly animated by the planet Saturn? Right. So that's like now we're talking like alchemy stuff there. Yeah. Right? And then it, it, it shows this image, um, figure two here. A modern drawing after Rudolf Steiner illustrating the disposition of human organs as taught in Rosicrucian philosophy. So yeah. it, it shows the depiction of the um, solar system mm -hmm. configured in such a way based on their orbits, I'm assuming. The, the patterns that something draws in the sky. And then it relates that to the lungs and heart, kidney, you know, all the vital organs. Yeah. It's a cool image. We'll put we'll throw it up. It is cool. Have it linked. Um The skeptic in me wants to be like, yeah, but it's only gonna look like that at a certain time of year. <laughs> well, if that year is when your alignment happens, then mm. you know, there's a lot of the the zodiacal zodiacal stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so it says uh science has coined the word biorhythms to describe the way that the way the relationships of the earth with the moon and the sun marked by the sequence of the seasons and day follow following night is built biochemically deep into the function of every living being. For example, in sleep patterns, but beyond these more obvious rhythms, the ancients recognized how other more mathematically comp complex rhythms that involve the outer reaches of the cosmos work their their way into human life. So it's saying the same way that the that, that we know that the 
there's biological effects when the moon and the sun and the earth are in certain configurations. Right. Like we know that there's an, there's an, a a physiological, physiological effect, especially for people who are more sensitive. Yeah. In whatever way. I just like want to know scientifically what's the mechanism, you know, like I can imagine like, like if we're way more sensitive to like gravitational fields than we think we are, then I mean, I or certain see, people are. Yeah. Certain and people with certain frequencies. The different planets being in different alignments would cause different gravitational patterns, but. Mm hmm. Maybe so it, electro, maybe there's like a big electromagnetic field that's shared between them. Or it's even just ge geometrically and, and mathematically, like they were saying, like it says yeah. here, it says humans breathe on average 25,920 times per day, which is the number of years in a great platonic year. So the number of years it takes the sun to complete a full cycle of the zodiac. Right. Is the same number of average breaths of in average a day. breaths in a day. Yeah, this reminds me of like Randall Carlson's talks about like yeah. all the measurement systems. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. I'll link and, to some of that. And he's, got he's some cool stuff. He's a he's that. a Freemason, and a lot of these these modern day um, esoteric and like um, groups, you know, stem from a lot of this. Right, ancient. The Freemasons philosophy. are one of those secret societies that per preserve a lot of this knowledge. Right. It's where a lot of this stuff came from. So um, it asks, um, in this interconnected was not, if this, so this sense of interconnectedness was not just a matter of bodily interconnectedness. It extended to consciousness too. When our man on a walk uh, uh, saw a flock of birds turn as one in the sky, it seemed to him as if the flock were removed altogether by one thought. And indeed, he believed that this was the case. If animals in the wood in the wood moved altogether in a, in, in a sudden, violent way, if they panicked, they had been moved by Pan. Our man knew at this... Well, hold on. Pan, the god, the deity Pan. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Okay. Our man knew that this was exactly what was happening because he commonly experienced great spirits thinking through himself and their other people at the same time. He knew that when he reached the mystery school and his spirit spiritual master introduced astonishing new thoughts to him and his fellow pupils, they would all be experiencing the very same thoughts. Just as if the master were holding up physical objects for them and to see in fact, he felt closer to people when sharing thoughts. He never did through mere physical proximity. Yeah. That's interesting. Hmm. So, master... I love that up etymology of the word panic for the god Pan. Oh, yeah. That's where we get that from. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it kind of goes on to talk about, like, more... Um, illustrations of like what it was like um when a thought came to the man walking through the woods he felt as if he had been brushed by the wing of an angel or by the robe of a god he sensed a presence even if he could not always perceive it directly and in detail that's kind of like the like a like if you're thinking about like creatives today right and they talk mm -hmm. about this flow state yeah, well, they, they talk, talk about, about like, like this a source of inspiration. That, yeah, like well, they'll create something great and they'll feel like it was like it happened to them rather than they created it. Yeah, it was an experience that they had that emanated in this work of whatever they were. But a lot of times, it's it's focused into what they were intending at the time. Yeah, it's, so it's I've like, had that experience. Like I used to break dance, and like at like the height of like my depth in it, like I I started to like scratch the surface of that flow state where you can just like your mind shuts off. Yeah, and you're not thinking or planning, but you're just being moved more than you are choosing the movements. Yeah, it's it's, it's just you just it's keep, a crazy to move. state to find yourself in. Have you ever had that in anything? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I've had moment. I I don't know that I, I especially at the time in my life, like I wouldn't have been able to, like, derive that from it. So, yeah. But like, there's a lot of times in your life where you just know you're in the you're you're in the zone, right? I never got that good with an instrument that I felt like I could just like turn my brain off. Like I can pick my way and create a song, but like, yeah. I never got like that proficient like I did. I would say with anything, for anything, it would be like with physical movements, like um, with sports and like certain aspects of like sports, like you you become like, those are like ways of like physically moving your body in a, in a certain way to. Yeah. I think a lot of people like attribute it to instinct. Yeah. Like it's more of a primal mode of the mind. Like you get to this point where like all of your, your preparation like falls behind what is instinctually just your ability to like go out there and like your instincts fall to a more subconscious or no, your, your conscious, everything you've worked on to like gain all of this knowledge and like prowess and whatever it it might be falls to a more uh, subconscious mode in that sense. Like once you get to like the flow state, it's like almost described as like, the subconscious takes over and the conscious becomes subconscious. In a sense. Right. Like you, you have all the knowledge you need, but then you turn on this mode of like not having to like think through it, you yeah, know, because it ruins the product. Anymore. Yeah. Right. You're, you're turning off that part, part of the brain in a sense, which is fascinating to think about. Like in this context, like people can achieve that from just thought. Hmm. Imagine achieving like a flow state in that from just creative thought and imagination. Dude. Like writers. If you're a writer or you practice any sort of like meditation or something and you've like experienced a mental flow state, write us a letter, host at dualitycheck.net. Describe Describe it to us. I'd love to hear about that. So it says here, we'll keep going. When a, when a thought came to the man walking through the woods, oh yeah, we said that. Um, today we experience moments of Ill- illumination as it, interior events while the ancients experienced them as impingingly on them from outside. Impinging on them from outside, yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't within. Like These thoughts are physical manifestations of the world around them right so mm-hmm. like they 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 are describing thought as something coming from from outside of themselves right which you know if Does you that actually just describe- try and quiet your mind like i've done like surface level meditation mm-hmm. but like yeah just the practice of like trying to stop thinking about stuff is a crazy practice because you find you that just thoughts that. happen spontaneously yeah without thought needing to have him having been there before the connections are already there for thought to happen so it's like trying to control it yeah which brings up the question like what are you like if you're not even your thoughts if your thoughts happen to you like what are you Cause you're not exactly your body. Like you're kind of contained within your body, but like, as long as and like, you, and you can lose pieces of it <laughs> as well, long yeah, as like, there's enough like, for it to live. Yeah. Like, you you're see yourself there. through perception in this physical form, but are you, and if you're not exactly your thoughts either, then what's left? Are you the ego part? Are you the, well, the, are you just the receptor? Way. Yeah. Are you the receptor that takes in the the experience of of your senses? Because your senses are are taking in more than what we are perceiving. Right. So like there are there are things to perceive outside of what our brains are designed to um, encompass. Like they they focus it to a point that can be utilized by our brain to create you know images of the world and create thoughts of you know past present future which gives us the ability to plan which gives us you know the ability to mourn and to suffer and like they go on to talk about this too when they talk about like the plant life and like once the the or the plant um the proto humans and once they became more solidified in human form like they were 
bound to suffer once the, once we became right. solid and human in the sense of not being connected to our to the ultimate like cosmic consciousness you know yeah should like, we get it? is that's the next chapter right should we i think so yeah jump into that or is there more on this one that you wanted to cover um i just want to we'll, we'll just finish with this i guess Returning to the man walking through the ancient wood, we now see that he experienced the spirits behind the sun, the moon, and other heavenly bodies as working on different parts of the mind and body. He felt his limbs moving like flowing, like the flowing mercury as he felt the spirits of Mars raging inside him in the fierce river of molten iron that was his blood. The state of his kidney was affected by the movements of Venus. Modern science is only just starting to understand the role the kidney plays in, in sexuality. At the, end, at the beginning of the 20th century, it, dis, it discovered that the kidney's role in the storing testosterone, um, then in the, yeah, so it found that out in the beginning of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. And then in the 1980s, the Swiss pharmaceutical giant, well, Walletta, began to conduct tests showing that movements of the planets affected chemical changes in the metal salt solutions that are dramatic enough to be seen with the naked eye. It's like a metal solution, metal salt solution within the body. I'm assuming. No, I think you like, or in a separate, like, yeah. you have, like your... so they, Oh, they were detecting that in there, but then they can conclude that it's happening in the, within the body as well. Right, if those are salt solutions that are natural to humans. Okay. Um, in mystery schools taught that as well as head consciousness, we each have, for example, a heart consciousness which emanates from the sun then enters our mental space via the heart. Or to put it in other ways, the heart is the portal through which the sun God enters our lives. Likewise, a kind of kidney consciousness beams into us from Venus, spreading out into our minds and body via the portal of our kidneys. So they, they, they talk about this portal thing. And I think Donald Hoffman talks about that too. This whole phenomena of like the consciousness part, like the particles, like being like, we are made up of like portals to like the consciousness that, is the universe, I guess. Right. Like, like every aspect of fractal our, parts of it in the same way that, that like our cells are like fractal parts of us. Yeah. Like so like sense. as the, as things change that we are, the different parts of our body are made up of particles that are yeah. portals to the, so this last text was kind of like alchemical slash old style medicine where, like if you detect that certain organs are high in certain minerals and you have like alchemical traditions for like what those minerals represent, what planets and bodies they're tied to yeah, in connection with, then you can draw like parallels for like where those other thoughts and associations associated with those planets, those beings, those entities. Mm-hmm. Like how they enter your body through the portal of that particular organ, which is an interesting view. And obviously science would hate it. (laughs) Of course. um, It's it's pretty fascinating. And like putting yourself in the shoes of that initiate back then walking through the woods. Like that's the way they see the world. feeling the world the way that way. Right. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating way to think about it. So that kind of wraps up. Chapter two or yeah, chapter two. Do you want to take a break or do you want to keep going here? Uh, we could take a short break. I don't have my music queued up, so the music is entering right now <laughs> in post. We'll be back. Yeah.
got a bad song's actually perfect for this segment. It's called Sunshine. And the one with lyrics, they're like... Hey, you've been good at that. Yeah. It's like the, the second time this has happened. <laughs> they're like personifying um, the sun, like as a woman. Like the, they're talking about a woman, but using all language that you would use to talk about the sun. Mm, like a ray of sunshine. Like yeah. Like a ray. Yeah. yeah. Which is like that whole personification, that whole... Dude, that anthropomorphization is, and that Seeing is meaning perfectly in the natural world that is perfectly appropriate <laughs> so we left off at the end of chapter two um that was the short walk in the ancient woods we are now going to chapter three the garden of eden this is going to come this is subtext subtitle here is the genesis code enter the dark lord the flower people. I don't think they say that. I don't think the Dark Lord is the flower people. I think they're those are separate. Yeah, I think that's like the state of like the proto humans at the time, right? Yep. So it says here, science and religion agree that in the beginning of the, co- the in the beginning the cosmos moved from a state of nothingness to the to the existence of matter, but science was very li- says very little. Has very, sorry, science has very little to say about this mysterious transition, all of it highly speculative. Scientists are even divided on whether matter was created all at once or whether it uh, it continues to be created. Right. By contrast, there were, there was remarkable uh, unanimity among the initiate priests that of the ancient world. Their secret teachings are encoded in the sacred texts of the world's great religions. In what follows, we will see the see how the secret history of creation is encoded in the most familiar of these texts. Genesis, how a few of these phrases of its phrases can be opened up to reveal extraordinary new worlds of thought, mighty vistas of the imagination. And we shall see too that the secret history chimes with the secret teachings of other religions. Mm. In the beginning, there precipitated out of the void matter that was finer and more subtle than light. Then came exceptionally fine gas. Fine gas. If a human eye had been looking at the dawn of history, it would have seen a vast cosmic mist. This gas or mist was the mother of all living, carrying everything needed for creation of life. The mother goddess, as she was sometimes also called, will metamorphose in the course of history and assume many different forms, many different names. But in the beginning, the earth was without form and void. Now, for history's first great reversal of fortune, the Bible narrative continues. Darkness was upon the face of the earth, according to biblical comment commentators working within the esoteric tradition. This is the Bible's way of saying that the mother goddess was attacked by a searing dry wind that almost extinguished the potential for life altogether. Again, to the human eye, it would have looked as if the gently interweaving mists that had first emanated from the mind of God were suddenly overtaken by a second emanation. So this is like the mother goddess and then it introduces here. So I think, I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to equate the mother goddess to like the the matter, the matter itself, the the very beginnings of matter, matter the very beginning of matter. Yeah. Before it was in matter as we know it. Right. Before it would like later on take the form of like mother earth. Right. Yeah. Okay. It was the mother goddess. And then it was a... What was that exact line he said there about the darkness that overtook it or whatever? So now for the for history's first great reversal of, the for, of fortune, the Bible narrative continues. Darkness was upon the face of the earth, according to biblical commentators, working within the esoteric tradition. This is the Bible's way of saying that the mother goddess was attacked by a searing dry wind yeah. that 
that uh, that almost extinguished the potential for life life altogether. Yeah, so it was attacked by darkness. And it, and it looked like a wind pushing and moving the, the matter. Yeah, I don't know how they get to the wind, but like I could see the darkness because like if this is like the allegory for like the beginning of the universe and like matter coming into form, like maybe you don't even have like stars yet, right? Yeah, but I think the wind is more uh, a comment on the movement, mm. like seeing the movement of the matter through whatever medium like it like i guess space or you know nothing the void yeah like it was it almost looked like a i guess to them but it does say to the human eye it looked as if it was as if the gently interweaving mists that had first emanated from the mind of god were suddenly overtaken by a second emanation so there was like a shadow yeah moving through okay so yeah the darkness um there was a violent storm, like some rare and spectacular phenomenon observed by astronomers, the death of a star, perhaps, except that here in the beginning, it would have been on a completely overwhelming scale that filled the entire universe. So, you know, if you were to look at, you know, the death of a star, like that's just insignificant to the scale at which we're talking about. Right. We're talking like in materialist terms, like during the big bang here yeah. still. So this is what it would have looked like to the physical eye, but to the eye of the imagination, this great cloud of mist and the terrible storm that attacked it, it can be seen to cloak two great gigantic phantoms. So I guess the phantoms would be the quote unquote gods that they represent or something mm -hmm. before we tried to make sense of this ancient history of the cosmos or to understand why so many brilliant people have believed in it. We must try to absorb it in the form in which uh, it would have been presented in ancient times as a series of imaginative, imaginative images. It is important to let these images work on our imaginations in the same way that the initiate priests intended them to work on the imaginations of a candidate for initiation. Right. So They'd try and visualize it. Yeah. You know, open your mind, let the images kind of seep in mm -hmm. and just like look at them and, and imagine, you know, the beginnings of time and what it might've been and like the connections. There's a lot of cool images in here. We'll have to kind of flip through them and post some of these good ones. So it goes on to talk about mother goddess's opponent, this force that was moving through this eminent second emanation. Her opponent was if anything more frightening, long and bony. His skin was scaly and white and had glowing red eyes swooping low over mother earth. The dark Lord was armed with a deadly scythe giving way to the identity to giving away his identity to anyone who has who hasn't already guessed it. For if this first emanation was from the mind of God, would metamorphose into the goddess of the earth, the second emanation would become the goddess, the god of Saturn. Right. Yeah. And it's, then it goes on to talk about how Saturn is Satan basically in the Bible? Yeah, he, the Saturn figure in Greek mythology is yep, Satan in the Bible. Exactly. Um, basically, it talks about the struggle between Saturn and and Mother, uh, the Mother Goddess, and talking about how. And then it gets to that part where she gets rescued by, like, the birth of, like, the sun, right? Um, that goes into the next chapter, I think, mm. but... Okay. Yeah, no, no, you're right, you're right. She hides him on an island, and, yeah. No, but, um, what I was gonna say is the... Basically, the, the conception here is that Saturn was... Is kind of, like, the beginning of material. Like, it's the beginning of the hardening. Like, it goes through the solar system... Mm -hmm. like Saturn being represented from the plat the planet, but also being rep like, this is like early stages when Saturn and all these different, the earth, everything was being formed. Right. And we're talking about something that is like 
being credited through this history as like giving further condensing matter to ultimately lead to us being able to exist. So like we're just as much of a byproduct of Saturn, Satan, as we are of the mother goddess. Right. And right. And whatever mind thought the universe into existence. So like, even though it's a dark destructive force trying to tear apart the mother goddess, it's part of the reason it's why inevitable. we have the existence we have today. Yep. It's that dichotomy. It's that dualism, the duality check, like that yin and yang, right? Like you need the opposing forces. Yeah, the opposing force characterizes the the force within good that you might characterize, right? Right. Like right. you have like to they have define the other each to, other. Yeah, right. you you can't have one without the other because you can't define good without there being something other than it. Right. You know. Right. So it's this same idea of like within every good thing there is there is bad, you know, or 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 something needs to be destroyed in order to give rise to or birth to something new. And it's this whole idea of like the human condition too, right? Like you talk about like we only live for a certain amount of time and we, you know, in, in the essence of it, like our, like we're here to continue the species. So we procreate and we have kids and we teach them everything we know. And like, we're right. like this, but this, if we don't die, if we don't decay, if we aren't like destroyed in the end, then the world would be overpopulated and there would be, everything would die anyway, because you know, like in not like necessarily a generation has to die to make room for the next generation. Not if the, everybody, not if we're talking and that's about like the time. mechanism of evolution and stuff too. Right. Like death is part of view, life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's like, once things become material, that's like intuitive. Like, but like if you're talking about a proto human in a proto world, like a proto earth and all these different protos right. of, it's of more, societies, it's like it's more symbolic at that point. Or yeah. it's like it's less defined, less uh if you think about the the emanation or the 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 cosmic mind as of God, basically, right? Like you're thinking of that that, that initial will that brought um consciousness or people um everything into being whatever that might have been right whether it be cosmic will or just a different universe creating another universe we don't know it could be simulation could be simulations all the way down maybe saturn is gravity but either way like you're talking about like um like the initial form of it and like so if you think about like back to panpsychism like which is kind of where this this whole book is kind of formed on like the idea that everything from the beginning of time was, has consciousness and it just coagulated into certain forms to create different types of consciousness that could think at different levels, that could experience at different levels. Yeah. But everything has an experience and everything is an experience of, of the, of the singular cosmic mind that created it all. Right. He talks about, um, he talks about like thought forms, like giving life to thought forms. Um, I believe earlier in this, like, I think it's one of the bits we skipped over where like the, the mind of the creator, like its thoughts took on, like its thought forms became that mother earth became that Saturn, right? Like those are like, Oh, originally like thoughts of the creator that then take on a life of their own because they had been thought. Right. Yeah. Like his thought was probably something more benign as far as like, Let's, I want to create something, uh, you know, my thought might have been, his thought might have been like there, whatever it was, would have been like creating the, the, the essence first. Like if you think of like thought before matter, you think mm-hmm. of the essence, like you think of like what you want it to be before you think of the form of the thing you want it to be in. Right. Yeah. So you think about like you, what, what characteristics of this new thing are you wanting and that's like this early stage. That's like the mother goddess phase before this darkness ensued. It's like this phase of just like pure thought emanations. And and they are coagulating in a sense of like the the thoughts are like if you think of like that, the the um, 
where where you could put sand on a drum and you drum it and mm-hmm. it creates patterns. Well, I don't know what the cymatics. Cymatics. That's it. Um, if you think about that same thing, like if you think about the spoken word, if you were to think about the emanation or the initial thought being a spoken word that that resonates in to matter and it forms these patterns, and that pattern is what we have now. But um, so it's basically like this. I guess it would, it's just creatively I'm thinking about this on the fly, but, um, so it's just a formation of like the resonance of the initial thought, like the thought had a, a resonance that is now forming mm-hmm. the the matter into a certain, but I'm pattern. trying to like nail down, like what is the Saturn character as opposed to the mother goddess character, right? Like if the mother mother goddess is like the myth, the material, like mm-hmm. the actual stuff, that was originally thought into creation. And then it sort of like goes on to describe Saturn as like further condensing matter. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that sounds like gravity to me, honestly, like it sounds like stuff gets spread everywhere and then it starts to come together. And maybe that's the influence of Saturn bringing things, making it denser, trapping matter into a little ball that it can't escape to form planets. But what was the thought behind that? What, what made that be the thing? So the, yes, the gravity was the manifestation of the, of the, like it was the physical, um, characteristics of what happened, but what was the thought behind that? What was the initial? Well, that's where I say it's like that yin and yang, right? Like if you just have a bunch of matter that's evenly distributed throughout the entire universe, and you don't have a force to pull it together and condense it. You don't have gravity, AKA like things like the big bang would have been very uninteresting. It would have just banged. And then there would be a bunch of gas floating everywhere. Evenly nothing would have condensed. Mm-hmm. So like, so in the, in the so idea of this, like, that's like, that thought of like the stuff. And then the thing that causes that stuff mm-hmm. to struggle and like pull together. Right. Which in the idea of this book and like the idea of this, like they're talking about like the God or the, 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 this Saturn character is, is, um, an emanation of the, the singular mind, right? It's, it's still this singular mind and it's, it, it's physical characteristics as has to how it interacts with the matter is, is not as important as what was the, derivative like what made them i guess what made the saturn do the things it did it was Mm -hmm. like an idea yeah of what they wanted so like yes but they're they're characterizing that that time with the mother goddess still as being like there was consciousness there Mm -hmm. and there was things happening it was just that there was a new thought and so it goes into it here and i'll and i'll and i'll read it real quick yeah do that the second great act in the drama of creation comes when the sun god arrives in the order in order to rescue the mother mother earth from saturn because saturn does all this destruction and moves everything and it creates all this chaos in the eye of the imagination the sun is a beautiful and radiant young man with a leonine mane he rides a chariot and he is a musician. He is he has many names, Krishna in India, Apollo in Greece. Arising in splendor in the midst of the storm, he pushes back the darkness of Saturn until it becomes like a dragon of the of, or serpent encircling the cosmos. Hmm. The sun then warms Mother Earth into new life. And as he does so, he gives vent to the great triumphant roar and reverberates to the outer limits of the cosmos. The roar causes matter in the cosmic womb to vibrate, to dance, and to form patterns. Mm -hmm. In intergroup um, esoteric circles, this process is sometimes known as the dance of the substances. After a while, it causes matter to coagulate into a variety of strange shapes. What we are seeing here, then, is the sun singing the world into existence. The sun line is a common image in ancient art. Whenever it appears, it refers to this early stage in the mind before matter account of creation, a magnificent magnificent retelling 
um, of the history of the sun line in the act of creation was written as late as the 1950s. It comes <clears throat> in the prequel to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe called The Magician's Nephew. Sometimes something that the not, that non-esoteric schools and literature critics criticisms have missed and that the work of C.S. Lewis is steeped in Rosicrucian lore. Mm. Yeah. So that talks about like the protection from this entity. Right. This, this happening. But they also go on to talk about how the sun was within the earth. Like it became like it was born of the earth. It was the, the, son of the, that's why it's called the sun is the son of mother mother earth mm. and it was it was started within the earth and then it was later in a later age that it was actually pushed out into the cosmos to create um, external life i just saw a scientific article talking or people questioning um if planets can form before their respective stars yeah. and they can in fact they sometimes would. And so it could be the case that like, so like he, he, he wants, obviously he's interpreting all this as like metaphorical, spiritual, like mm -hmm. that right. side of things. But like, I can't help but like relate it as relate like it, a yeah. analogy um, to the physical processes, like as if this is some sort of like handed down knowledge. Yeah. That, you know, survived in this fashion. Um, so in that sense, like it could be the case that like you have these proto planets, you would have these proto planets forming as soon as the, you know, the early sun is starting to form and before it even fully ignites. Yeah. So the sun could be just the dim red glow, like not even fully lit. Right. While the planets are coming together. And because then all it's of a sudden still, it lights still mass. up. And it would save the earth from darkness and give life to it. Yeah, because Saturn was wreaking, wreaking havoc on earth before. Right. Poor energy, poor radiation, give movements to the atmospheres and, you know, like literally breathe life into the planet, mm -hmm. save it from the darkness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... And as it's told as being within it and then moving externally to give life, like that could just be that <clears throat> we were much closer to it, you know, mm. or, or in a sense we ignited it with some, somehow, you know, yeah, like there was some event on, on earth that like ignited the glow of the, of what we know now know as the sun being in the cent center of our, of the um, solar system. But yeah, I mean, we were planning to do seven chapters today. I think we got through three. Yeah. It was ambitious. <laughs> we'll probably skim a lot of the later ones. Cause yeah, it started to get, it gets into some of these historical periods, which I find interesting, but not like as interesting as like origin stories. Like I find origin stories of the universe to be super fascinating. Yeah. It's definitely a very thought provoking. A lot of these, stories and accounts and ways of thinking about the f physical nature of the beginning of time, even though there wasn't much physical about it. Yeah. Not time specifically, but what, uh, where does um, it go after that? Or, I mean, it goes off to a lot of like the plant life or proto human stuff. Mm. Which we could probably start with if we wanted to on another episode. Okay. But um, I'll just finish it off here with with saying this. Um, this is from um, a little bit further, further down. It says, what the teachers of the mystery schools meant to indicate by the victory of the sun god was the momentous transition from a purely mineral cosmos to a cosmos burgeoning with plant life. In the earliest and most primitive form of plant life, according to the mystery, mystery tradition, single germs were joined together in a vast floating structures like webs that filled the whole universe. In commentaries on the Vedas, the sacred books of India, 
This stage of creation is described as the net of Indra, an infinite net of luminous living threads perpetually interweaving, coming together like waves of light, then dissolving, the dissolving again. Time passed and some of these threads began to weave together more permanently. The light streams dividing the tree-like forms, an imaginative impression of what it was like, can perhaps um, be got by remembering what it was like as a small child to visit a great hothouse like the ones that Alice Liddell, the girl who inspired Alice in Wonderland, visited. Um, I like to visit in the Kew Gardens, great tendrils. I think that's a British term for a uh, for a greenhouse, a hothouse. Oh, a hothouse. Okay. I I figured that once I got into it a little bit. Um, great tendrils stretch everywhere. Here, a human mist and a sunny, luminous green greenness. If you were able to land in the midst of the of all of this, and if you sat on one of the great green branches stretching out of sight, and if this great branch on which you were sitting suddenly stirred, you would have experience like a hero in a fairy tale, sitting on a rock that moves and reveals itself to be a giant. Because the vast vegetable being of the heart of the cosmos, whose soft and luminous limbs stretched to all four corners of it, was Adam. Mm. Ooh, so that's a good place to leave us, because I think we're going to get into a lot of that Adam and Eve creationist mm. um, stuff. Yeah, so this it, is all it finishes like, like super... this. This was paradise. Um. <laughs> So, yeah, I think we can start off on that. <laughs> so it's saying this, like, celestial threads of life was Adam? Yeah, so, so it's, yeah, exactly. So it's saying, like, the interweaving, like, web-like nature of it, where it was, like, all these fine mists, but they were coagulating into points that connected in a web throughout the universe. And it obviously changed and moved, but that the beginnings of this was the, like the story. That makes me think of, uh, Chandra Rikwam Singh. He, he, yeah, they, they reference him in here, I believe. Oh, do they? Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause he, he's like a decorated mm -hmm. uh, physicist who, uh, is like a, who's like spent his career studying the panspermia idea. Mm-hmm. And he's got whole like books and lines of thinking. Uh, I saw his talk for the Cosmic Summit last year, and it was uh, he talked about the panspermia ideas, talked about how with like uh, mass spectrometry and stuff, like you can actually like analyze some of the nebula clouds out there in the universe and show like complex hydrocarbons, not just like a cloud of hydrogen gas. Like we're talking the Formations. stuff, the stuff that life is built out of, if not like actual life, life. right? So his theory is that like so life formed elsewhere, and then you know, on, shot across on the infant Earth as it was forming, it was you know hitting down here in meteors and stuff, and yeah. these like sorts of like extremophile forms of life that can survive and. The vacuum of space and whatnot. Waited until there was water. You know, they land on Earth and they start multiplying. Yeah. So that life didn't start here. So in that case, like, that makes sense with this, like, allegory of, like, the atom being, like, this cosmic those, like, cosmic web. webs of yeah. life. Because that would ultimately be our source. Yeah, there's a cosmic web of, like, the source of life and it's being pushed in and out into the cosmos from the beginning. So it's just where it lands, where it, maybe where it lands matters. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Dude. This yeah, no, this is, is going to be cool because we're going to stop here and we'll mark it and we'll continue. Um, it's going to be a series. So yeah, this could also be, and we'll give you other we... subjects in between. If this isn't the type of subject matter you like. Exactly. So. It'll be every few episodes. We'll come back and do another episode of this. But, uh, and then once we're done with this book, we'll talk about what's the next core. Or we'll one take to cover. suggestions. Yeah.
something that we neither of us have read that we'll pick up and read and talk about. Yeah, based on what you heard so far, if there's stuff you think we should read or check out, like yeah. send us some suggestions. Yeah, because we're 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 <laughs> humble in the fact that there's a lot that we still want to discover about. This, oh yeah, this like stuff. all these topics fascinate me, but like as like I've read some on it, but like I'm not nearly well read enough and there's a whole universe of stuff out there to check out. Yeah. And so. if any of you have saw anything that we haven't covered already or talked about, then even if we have like, let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Email us host at dualitycheck.net. Yeah. Um, follow our, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, send us a message that um, way. Comment on YouTube. Give yeah, us a we're thumbs on YouTube up. YouTube and, and rumble. And a like, please help us. Give us some comments. Talk about it. You know, we'll, uh, whatever you're listening on, like if you're listening on iTunes, if you can go on and give us a review or if on Spotify, I know they have a review system too. I think you have to have listened to a few episodes before they'll let you do it. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the threshold is there, but any sort of like engagement you can like do for the show would really help us grow. That helps like get other people's eyes on our material, share yep. it to someone that you think might like talking about these weird topics. Yeah, we're happy to, you know, we're planning on doing some kind of email, you know, reading session if we can get it. Yeah. So we want to we want to hear from everybody and take questions and talk totally. about things and yeah. take recommendations and whatever you might have. But uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for listening being so with us today on episode five. Episode five. We've given you a little bit of the secret history of the world, and uh, now we got to watch out for the secret societies to come after us. Yeah. Or just the copyright people. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Take care. We'll talk to you later. Adios. Adios.